Runners only with Dom Harvey. Runners only with Dom Harvey and the relatively reclusive Adam Perori. G'day, mate. Dom, how are you? Fantastic, mate. Oh, thank you so much for coming over. Um, this was organised through your girlfriend Libby. Um, you, you're a shocker on social media, so I'll, I'll DM you, <laughs> and then a week later you'll get back to me. And yeah, but she made this happen overnight. Yeah, she did. Well, about ten minutes actually. Yeah, um, phenomenal. Yeah, I don't. You're spend, under the thumb. I don't spend a lot of time on the uh, on the socials. I'm an infrequent visitor. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate you being here, Adam Perore, first ever Maori to represent New Zealand in cricket. Retired with 204 test dismissals, which I believe is still a New Zealand record. Uh, no, I think I think BJ Watling snuck past me a few years ago. Right. I think I'm not 100 percent sure. I don't follow that stuff that closely. Another record that still stands: highest one day international innings without scoring a boundary. That was 96 runs against oh, India, and that'll never be broken. <laughs> Nobody could play that badly for that long. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> that represents a lot of running, which is good. We'll get to that. It's a running theme podcast. Um, also, the only test cricketer to ever reach the summit of Mount Everest. Yeah, that might, um, yeah, I would be curious to see if any other cricketer decides that that's a good idea. Probably not. I would have thought so. Right. So, so what, is, what is your relationship with running? We mentioned before that 96 um, in 1994 against India, uh, which was made up of singles and twos and maybe a three or a threes. Might have been a few, but there's a, a lot of ones and twos. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I, I love running and still do, but I'm a bit limited these days. Um, but that was always the base of my cardio. I used to run when I was playing. I would run uh, 10Ks six days a week in about 34 to 36 minutes. I think 33, 23 was my best. Um, Is that right? This isn't a case no, of... this isn't a case. <laughs> this isn't a case of the, the older I get, the better I was. Is that a no, legit no. time? Yeah, that was it. That, that was, is heaving. Yeah, yeah, that was flat stick. Um now I can run about uh, six k's, and I do that three times a week, and that's probably about my limit. My, I tend to pull calf muscles if I do if I load it too much. What sort of pace? But I love it. What sort of pace now? Just like about ju- four minute four minute k's at my best. Four and a half is comfortable. Um, and you've probably seen me. I've got a little bit of a circuit past your place actually. That is a great pace. Um, that's incredible pace. Yeah. You're fifty. Fifty two now. <laughs> And can't quite shift like I used to, but it feels like I'm still going the same speed. So you could still do a sub sub twenty five, possibly on yeah, the best day. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, how good! But I enjoy it. I like it. Um, what for, for the physical health benefits or the mental health benefits or both? Com- yeah, both. And also, I like the way it feels. Um, I walk most days, so I'll do uh, at least an hour of walking, um, and then probably forty five minutes in the gym, and then uh, if I'm if I'm t- Triple crowning, I call it. I'll then do the, the 6K run on top, which I did last mm. night. Um, and sometimes I break it and I'll walk in gym in the morning and then in the afternoon I'll go out for a run for, you know, 30-odd minutes. Yeah, I mean, physically you're looking in, you're looking in great, Nick. You really are. I'm, I'm probably in better shape now than when I played professional sport, or close to it. Is that so? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, um, it's been like 20 years since you played professional sport. Yeah. Um, well, I don't have to play anymore, so I've got plenty of time to train. Yeah, right. And I, I heard rumours about you when you were playing. You, you'd often um, like play a game and then run home. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah like not, not for New Zealand, though. This must have been lower levels. No, no, for New Zealand. Um, <laughs> like run back to the hotel. I went for a run where I think it was a uh, 1999 test match against the West Indies at the Basin Reserve in Wellington. And we were, we'd fielded for a very long time. Um, and I think there was a couple of hours to go. It was just after tea, I think, and a beautiful day in Wellington. And I'd been fielding for a day and a bit, and I thought I'd just go out for I didn't think I'd be batting that day. So I thought I'd just go out for a bit of a run just to loosen up a little bit and just clear my head. And I went out around the bays at Oriental Bay, and I had my uh, little radio on so I could listen to the cricket. Um, and <laughs> guess what happened? Um, <laughs> I, got, I got sort of four or five Ks from the basin. I think I was doing my normal sort of 10 Ks, and then all of a sudden three or four wickets fell. I was three Ks from the basin and next in. Um, oh my so god! You must I have been to, shitting yourself. <laughs> I was, Did you get a taxi or? No, I was. I honked it back and managed to get in there. Scrambled into the dressing room. Everybody was freaking out as to where I was. Obviously, who um, was the coach then? Uh, Ninety nine. That must have been Steve Rickson. I right. think. Um, Did you get in trouble afterwards? Well, no, not really. But um, I can't remember. <laughs> oh, that, that is lo- <laughs> That is. Well, yeah, but and then I was batting like ten, ten minutes after I got my gear on. <laughs> I'm still sweating, and then somebody got out, and I'm batting, right? Literally 10 minutes later. 
Um, how was it? How were you even allowed to leave the ground? Well, I wasn't when? allowed after that. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of that. But it's not like I was going for a beer, right? I was going out for a jog. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Um, um, oh, that's incredible. Uh, yeah. So. Hey, I, so I found this book in my bookshelf yesterday. <laughs> I haven't seen that for a few years. This is called um, uh, The Great Little Cricket Signature Book. Uh, I think this is like 30 years old. This is um, This is just when you were beginning to play... For new, just wow. just about to overtake Ian Smith as the the wicket keeper yep, for New Zealand, yep. early nineties. So I thought what we could do right now, um, yeah. When was the last time you have you got a copy of this at home at all? No, no. Like, what, I signed a lot of those back in the day, but yeah. I wouldn't have seen a copy of that for twenty years. When you, when you see that photo of um, a young Adam, it's a sprightly young fellow, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Do you feel like the same person? I'm guessing physically you feel the same, but uh, do you know what, Dom? It, it's like that was like a different life. Like, it really was like a different life. Yeah. Um, uh, I occasionally pick up my autobiography and sort of read a page or two out of that, which is quite embarrassing. Um, actually, Libby, my partner, just emailed me this morning and said, have you got a copy of this lying around? Because she's been badgering me about reading it for a couple of weeks. And I've just sort of ignored it, hoping that would go away. But she bought a copy of it, so that's embarrassing. Um, yeah, amazing. Uh, but, yeah, it's literally like a different life. Yeah, um, well, it is. I mean, it's, yeah, 30 years ago. 30 years ago. So you're a young guy there at the start of your career. So I thought yeah. what we could do right now... Um, I'll put the questions to you, and we'll see what your answer is now in comparison to your answer <laughs> 30 years ago. How does that sound? You know, so this will be fun. This will okay. be interesting. What's your nickname? Uh, AP. Oh, yeah. It was Maverick back then. Yeah, yeah. my cricket so, mates and my old friends still call me Mav. But Top Gun reference or? Yeah, yeah, yeah Martin yeah. Crow gave me that um, oh, how back awesome. in the day. Yeah, yeah so that was, awesome. that was Crow's nickname, but now everyone just calls me AP. Yeah. What's your favourite food? Uh, probably fish and steak. So it's no I longer am, my girlfriend's Kate. My girlfriend Kate's pasta salad. No, don't eat pasta. <laughs> haven't eaten pasta for a long time. Are you still? Are you you're still friends with Kate? You still know Kate? Uh, haven't seen her for a few years, yeah. but occasionally bump into her. Yeah, yeah, yeah oh, still, nice, still nice. on good terms. Um, my favourite music is. Uh, I listen to a lot of house music. Um, yeah, I've got various DJs who I like. Yeah, right. Can you remember who it was back then for a young adult? Oh, it would have been the Cars or something like that, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, the Cars, Queen, Brian Adams, Cat yep. Stevens. Yep. Yep. Um, my ambition in life is, what's your ambition in life now? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I kind of feel like I've sort of done a lot of that. I think... Um, Shit, you have done a lot. Probably just to be happy. Um, yeah. I, I have ambition for my family. Um, as in your kids, I, yeah, kids, yeah. and um, you know, and close friends. Mm. I have some ambition for them, and I enjoy celebrating their success. Less so for me now, um, but I do enjoy seeing, particularly the kids, right when they're mm. successful. I enjoy that a lot. I, I know, that, I know that's a genuine answer, but um, I, I still reckon there's a lot for you to do, and you'll still keep chasing those ridiculous goals like climbing Everest. Maybe not as extreme as that, but yeah, I sort of. Um, Starting to get to the point now where I, I did, I did harbour a, a thoughts of a second crack at K two, um, but I think now that's probably that's sort of probably been put to bed once mm. and for all. Um, what, but because I, of the risk involved, or just the timings, right? right you know, it's okay. a ten week expedition. Yeah. The risk doesn't worry me so much because um, I know how to manage that sensibly. Um, but it's just a big commitment emotionally and physically and, and mm. I'm sort of at that stage of my life where I can't disappear yeah. for 10 weeks. Yeah, right. Um, just too selfish and you're too busy. Just doesn't really work yeah. with, with the structure of my life at the moment, to be honest. Yeah, so your ambition in life back then, can you remember what it would have been? No idea. Okay. No um, idea. To beat Hogan's father, Goose at, t- at tennis. <laughs> Is that Hogan? That's, uh, Martin, that's Martin Crow? Yeah. yeah. Did yeah. you ever beat his dad at tennis? No, no. no, that, no. And that, that loops back to a story in France... Uh, where we played on clay, on clay. Um, Goose must have been sixty. I was nineteen, and he <laughs> ran me around and humiliated me. And my um, my response to being beaten was sort of um, yeah, was was not quite what it could be. <laughs> Let's say that. Yeah, yeah. Ass kicked by an elderly man. Yeah, I did. I um, really got uh, I d- got tipped out real good. I got a lesson. Um, back then, your your other ambition in life was to um, go on tour where my phone bill cost less than a thousand dollars, which it ages this somewhat. I mean, a thousand dollars back then would have been considerable. Now, with like international roaming, you can get like five bucks a day yep. in most places. Yep. Yep. Um, another one was to be married with children. You've done that a couple of times. Done that a few times now. A few, um, a few times. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there, yeah, you, you, yeah, you take most of them off. Um, my interests include what are your interests now? 
Mountain climbing, obviously. Yeah, mountaineering. Uh, spend a lot of time on the businesses, obviously. Um, do a lot of hiking. Um, um, what else do I do? Fitness, sports. Mm. Uh yeah, I, I try to live pretty healthily, um, mm. so I'm quite into health, fitness, wellness, all that yeah. sort of stuff. Um, spend a lot of time on that. Yeah, back then it was um, tennis, rugby, baseball. Touch on Sunday mornings with the lads because you have to run off a hangover. <laughs> Sleep, <laughs> Still sli- have to do that occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> Sleeping in, days on the beach, getting crazy with J- Jamie Hall. Who's Jamie Hall? Uh, one of my old cricket buddies from right. from England. Right. Um, yeah. No, the good summers. They were good yeah. summers. Yeah. Is this, how does this feel here? Are, are, are your toes curling or are these good memories? No, these are good memories. Yeah. Good memories. Um, the best piece of clothing I've ever owned is? Oh, well, I'm pretty habitual, to be honest. Um, back then, I'm wondering, probably would have been Timberland boots or something like that, I suspect. Now it's um, more suits and um, suits and trainers, right. probably. No, back then it was an old blue jersey I pinched from Kate. I actually remember that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is that the one in the photo or no? No, 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 no. no it was a bit older than that, but I do uh, remember it. Um, I would hate to be without, what would it be now for Adam Perori? Uh, probably kids and family and friends, yeah. to be honest. Yep. Um, they're a pretty close group of friends, particularly um, that I've built up over 30 years. Mm. And those guys have been with me the whole way. Um, mm. And obviously family's pretty important now. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Being um, almost the same, same age as you, I think um, yeah, the friends and the connections you have when you, when you hit 50, um, it's a reflection of the life you've had up to that point. Yeah, I think so, and yeah. I think um, certainly in my case, those guys have been with me through all of it, good mm. stuff and the bad, and um, yeah, I, I would hate to think that uh, they weren't around anymore. Yeah. Um, back then, um, I'd hate to be without my Game Boy, <laughs> Kate, a sense of humour, and my green jeans. Okay, Shrek, um, <laughs> what were the green jeans? Well, the, I, if I remember <laughs> rightly, that was sort of a, it was a coloured jean period, there were red, green... <laughs> I don't know if I was ambitious <laughs> enough to try Jesus. white, but there was all sorts of colours. Yeah. Um, which dates that considerably. There, there's an answer here which um, you, you you would never dream of saying now. You'd be cancelled for this. Um, <laughs> if, if I wasn't me, I would like to be... No idea. Uh, so, who would it be for Adam Perori now, though, is it? Uh, if you learned yourself. Yeah, that's a funny question because I kind of quite like being Yeah, oh, that's um, cool. That's a gr- leave it at that. Yeah, that's a great answer. Yeah. Back yeah. then, um, if it wasn't me, I'd like to be a fly on the wall in Al McPherson's bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> well, that certainly dates it, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, the worst job I ever had was, what would it be now? Uh, whew, what did I used to do? I painted fences in the seventh form um, mm. for a living. That was pretty brutal. Mm. Um, no, but from where, from your perspective now as a 52-year-old man, worst job ever? Um, yeah, tough question, actually. Um, I kind of quite like working, yeah. um, and I think the work ethic that I was taught in the cricket side, particularly, um, has been a real asset. You know, like the more so that the culture in that team was, the more senior you got, the more you sort of pitched in and helped out. Yeah. Um, and so I learned to do all the shit jobs. You know, mm. at the end of you know, I think I'd played three, four hundred games by the end of my career. I was still picking up cones at the end of practice. Yeah. Um, and that I think that work ethic and that culture has sort of stayed with me. So I typically, you know. I'd clean up the dishes. I'd do all that stuff, mm. right? Um, yeah, isn't that fun? So, so yeah, cause I, I read a book um, recently called Legacy, which is about mm. the uh, the All Blacks, and they, they talk about that in this book and what makes the All Blacks so successful. And there's a thing like no dickheads policy, and yep. there's even the most senior players will sweep the sheds afterwards. So yep. the Black Caps have been doing that for decades. For decades, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. That was one of the things Steve, Rich can, Steve Rickson and John Graham introduced, and it really stuck with me. Even now in the businesses, I never ask anybody... Um, to do anything that I wouldn't right. do myself. Cool. And I, I think in terms of leadership, you know, it's quite a good way to connect with mm. people. Um, if they see you on the tools, all of a sudden there's a there's common bond. So, yeah, I do all the shit jobs, mate. Yeah, oh, that's good. Well, back then, uh, the worst job you ever had was um, a hero paper run when you were nine, which you were fired for for being late. Yeah, yeah, that was brutal. <laughs> it was sort of 5.30 a.m. starts. <laughs> Not um, great for a... For 11 a bucks a week or whatever it yeah. was, $11.40 oh. I used to get. I did 108 papers. Um, your um, earliest memory. What, yeah, what's what's the earliest thing you can remember now? Um, oh, I remember um, the first day of school. So as a five year old, five years old yeah. um, you yeah, remember that pretty vividly. Um, we were living out in Pakaranga. There went to a primary school called Wakaranga in Farm Cove. So yeah, I remember getting myself to school first mm. day, terrified. 
It's probably the earliest, I think. Isn't that funny? Such a vivid memory. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Back then, you said, um, running around stark naked, covered in finger paint, wearing a blue cape and pretending to be Superman. Oh, yeah. I was 17. Just, just <laughs> kidding, I was three. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, when we lived in Australia. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah I do remember that yeah. too, actually. And uh, my most embarrassing moment was, what would it be? Oh, shit. There's been a few. Um, they're quite difficult to pinpoint. Um, I think, like, with a bit of maturity, you look back at all sorts of different occasions where you've just made a bit of a tit of yourself. Um, so it's hard to pick out one, but mm. there's number um, yeah um, the sports stuff didn't I, I, don't, I don't really find that embarrassing I think more your own sort of the way you behave personally um, I find it every now and then when I, <laughs> this is pretty embarrassing <laughs> you're sorry we're just about like at when the you, end of it when you have a bit of a window into how immature you were um at a time when you thought you were quite mature, mm. that, that, that's pretty embarrassing, mate. Um, I think that's the exciting thing about life, though. Eh? I've sort of realised the older I get, the less I actually know about shit, and the more you're learning, yep. and the more you're evolving, and the more you're changing. And I think in terms of growing up, you know, like, um, you know, as a young man, you get to sort of 18 or 20, and you think you're all done, right? Mm. Which is just, uh, like, looking back at that, it's just, it's ridiculous. Um, oh, yeah, when, when I was that age, I, I, I would think... Being 50 is not worth living anymore. <laughs> well, yeah, I was sort of couldn't imagine myself there. Um, didn't think I was going to be anything like this, but I think, you know, a little bit of, and I've been embarrassed, humiliated, all of that stuff, and on some of the biggest stages in the world, right? Mm. And I think that's good for. Oh, in terms of like cricket. And, and growing, in yeah. terms of growing yeah. you up, right? Um, you need all that stuff to turn into a man, mm. um, which is not something you think about when you're 18, right? You mm. just think it's all going to be pretty straightforward yeah it doesn't work like that um, oh, I, I, I agree I I, I, um, I, I used to and I, I still do but it's something I try and confront I used to have, have this um, terrible fear of failure to the point where I'd, I wouldn't do things if there was a chance I'd fail and I've yeah. missed out on so many opportunities in life for that but I suppose cricket's one of those sports where yeah, you're out there and uh, the, the chance to be embarrassed or humiliated or fail is so high well you fail most days right yeah you know, get used to it yeah. who you are um uh, particularly with the wicket keeping, where my standards were, uh, well, my standard was perfection, right? Mm. Um, that was it. I did it half a dozen times, I think, and perfection to me was the perfect day, which started in the morning when I woke up. So I would brush my teeth perfectly. When I got in the lift, I would push the button perfectly. Oh, how do you how do you how do you Just push a button everything. not perfectly? Like straight in the middle, right? Like right. Literally, uh, and I and I was very focused on you know even when I was warming up and I. I'd make sure that I did it as close to perfect as I could. And then for me, a clean sheet, as we used to call it, was literally to catch every ball, which is impossible, right? All somebody has to do is just throw one five feet over your head and mm, you can't mm. achieve it. So you need, well, you need perfect execution and then also you need luck. Um, and I think I did that four or five occasions maybe over the course of my career. Um, and that was always, and the guys knew. So Flem standing next to me at first slip knew. Nath at second knew. Um, I remember one day at Eden Park, we were four or five balls from the end of the day and I was on a clean sheet, which was unheard of, right? Mm. Um, and and as, as open to your own perfect execution as it is to chance, and then one sort of rolled along the ground and um, bounced up, hit me in the shoulder and popped off to phlegm. And I was, my heart sank and um, nobody knew except the guys next to me. And they were as heartbroken as I was, right? They were like, come on, man, keep going, keep going. And I think that's, you know... That's the, the, the quest, isn't it? The elusive quest for perfection. Yeah, you, you're chasing it like a, a near impossible thing, but is that is that part of what made you so good? I think so, yeah. That yeah, just that relentless striving. drive yeah. for nothing was ever good enough. Right. Like I remember in my, in my cricket career particularly, every single day I would be disappointed because um, the mistakes that I made, I knew that, you know, I, uh, that I was that I didn't I, that I was actually good enough not to make any mistakes. It's an exhausting way to live your life, though. Exhausting way to spend your career. Mentally, it was just so draining, right? Um, so, so you, you'd wake up in the morning of a game, and would you be excited or would you be anxious? How would you feel? Or just uber focused? Uh, depends on the state of mind. If I was if I if I'd had a poor day the day before, all I wanted to do was get back out on the field and erase it. And until I did that, I was mentally sort of feeling quite out of sorts and. Typically not in a great place. Um, and that mental challenge is enormous. Um, like even now, I play in the Black Clash once a year, and I'm still the same. Like the level of anxiety while I'm performing 
Um, is that right? Exactly the same. That's yep. the you know, that's the hot spring spa thing. It was on. Um, it's on January each year, so it's a bunch of old cricketers and yep. uh, old rugby players playing against each other. It looks yep. like a, it looks like a fun thing. It's a great day. Everyone does take it kind of seriously, though, right? Everyone takes it very seriously, yeah, mate. Yeah. Um, and the standards, certainly for me, exactly the same, right? Still expect mm. perfection. Um, well, that, yeah, because I was going to ask you because um, so you, you're growing up, you're a young fella, um, you play softball, you're quite good at that. Yep. And then you yep. switch to switch to cricket, and you're, you're you're a fucking natural. You're playing for Auckland at the age of seventeen, New Zealand at the age of nineteen. I was going to ask how much of it is natural talent, because obviously there was some of that there, but obviously you worked bloody hard as well. Yep. Yeah. No, there was a lot of work, but the particularly the wicket keeping that was quite. I wouldn't say easy, but it was nat- It's natural. Okay. Um, which is why I can sort of still do it much the same now. Um, for small bursts, right? Like I, I probably couldn't keep wicket in a test match five you know like keeping for two days in a row in terms of squat, squat, couldn't do squatting that. down for that long as a yeah. 52 year yeah. yeah but you know in a 20 a 2020 game it looks kind of the same yeah, as it yeah, always yeah, did right yeah, yeah, yeah. um and so that's that's fun to be able to do that but the, the physical limitations are just different right you yeah know, i couldn't play for five out of seven yeah. days for four weeks like the guys do um but it still feels exactly the same well, literally it's quite natural and i've spent you know, t- tens and tens of thousands of hours perfecting my craft, basically. Um, and that, miraculously, that doesn't go away. I remember when I played in the first Black Clash game, I literally hadn't had gloves on for almost 20 years, like from the time I walked off the field at Eden Park in 2003 or whenever I retired, to when I got to the game, I hadn't kept working in between. Um, I hadn't practised. I just put them on and it was exactly the same. I went... Well, that, that's just, good. Just muscle memory. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly the same. It must have been a little bit of rust there in the beginning. Not much. No. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah, not much. Um, so, and that was, I think that's the culmination of literally tens of thousands of hours of, yeah. of, yeah. of learning your craft. Um, and also, it took a while to perfect it, right? It was, you know, I played international cricket at 19, it wasn't until I was probably 28, I think, that I'd sort of finally perfected my craft. Yet yeah, I thought at 19 I was sort of pretty, knew everything. pretty done, yeah. right? Well, yeah. I was definitely good oh. enough to go and play test cricket and look like I belonged. Mm. But I was still a long way from where I ended up. Mm. Um, yeah, so, you, yeah you, so you, you, you became a New Zealand player at the age of 19, um, taking over from Ian Smith, who I'm guessing as a young fellow growing up was all you knew in terms of the New Zealand wicket keeper because he held yep. that position for such a long time. Did you, um, were you in awe of him or did you have this youthful arrogance where, you, you know... No, he, he'd coached me since I was 12 years old, right. so we were mates, right? Um, and he was very much sort of a, a mentor to me and, and showed me the ropes, promoted me. Um, and so had a great relationship with Smithy. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, he was very, very good to me. Very, very good to me. Yeah, oh, that's cool. Um, so you, you, now you retired in um, 2002 when you were 31. Um, last innings was um, opening batsman with Mark Richardson. Do you, do you, like, in hindsight, do you regret retiring then? Like, you still had a lot to give, didn't you? Or did you feel like you'd done it all? Or Why, did, why did you retire at 31? I just got to that point where I'd played for 12 years by that stage, I think. Um, I'd, I'd achieved everything that I wanted to. Um, and also I was very conscious of the fact that I wanted to move on and do other things. Like I never thought that cricket was going to be my life. Um, I thought it was always going to be a really important part of my life, but it was never going to be my life. And I was just at that stage where I got to the point where I was accumulated a fair bit of baggage, I think, and it was starting to feel quite heavy. Had it, what, um, what sort of baggage? Just being around, just travelling and touring for a long time. I'd literally done everything in the game. Mm. Um, I think probably the only thing that was left was to beat Australia in a test match, and that that ambition remains to this day. That never happened for me. Um, um, and I think that's probably the only thing that I didn't achieve outside of you know maybe winning a World Cup or something, which was... A bit of a stretch goal back then. I think we made mm. the semis pretty consistently, but we yeah. probably weren't quite good enough to get there. Um, that was kind of the only things that sort of eluded me, to be honest. The rest of it I'd sort of done, and, mm. and I wanted to go on and do different things. At that stage, um, you know, having a family and having a normal life was quite appealing because I'd never done that. Yeah, um, of course. And I was in that sort of no man's land where I was sort of like, well, either I get out now, and then you know, I, I, I'm going to have to start. A, a career in business, whatever I choose to do at the bottom. I'm going to have to go pick up cones again. Um, that's how it works. Uh, and if I don't do it now, you know, by the time I'm 
then I'm sort of stuck here for another five years. Do I really want to do that? It's sort of limiting my options in terms of being in a proper relationship and family and all that yeah. stuff. Although so it was a difficult decision. It yeah. took me a few years to get my head around yeah, it. Did it wasn't easy, and I, I went early, and I've never regretted it. Mm. Um, so what, was the, what was the money like through your 20s as a cricketer? Was there any money in the game? Or? Yeah, I made. I was making sort of 200 to 250 I think, um, right through there, which... Back then was a lot of money for a oh, sportsman. Oh, two two hundred two fifty k. Yeah, right. Okay, yeah, oh, that's yeah. good. Which was good a lot point. of money for a sportsman back then. Yeah, um, yeah. But I spent it all. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it just goes. Yeah. I don't know where it goes. I it had just... a really nice life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I certainly didn't retire from cricket, and and, and I certainly wasn't wealthy, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was the other thing. I was sort of like, well, I wouldn't mind having some money one day, and I'm probably not going to get there mm. doing this. Um, mm. So it was a culmination of lots of different things. It took me a long time to get my head around it. It was yeah. a difficult decision, but one I've never regretted. But you, um, I mean, you you weren't an idiot though. Like you had a law degree. You you studied for a law degree while you were. Yeah, I did two degrees. I yeah. did finance and law. So I did accounting and finance right. first, and then I did I did my law degree on the road with the cricket team. Right. Um, so yeah, so so you say you you know you had to start at the bottom of any career pick out cones, but I mean you, you were yeah. you were well educated. Well, yeah, you were in I a good was. position. But, but I was right, you know. I went to um, I went to JB Weir Goldman Sachs here in Auckland, um, out of cricket, and started off in the private client team, um, working for a guy called John Cobb, um, and I literally made coffee, mate. Um, you know, I I would start it at the bottom. Mm. Um, I managed to survive two restructurings at, at, at Goldman's, but I knew I wasn't going to get through a third one. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if you're making a good coffee and you're being paid so little, they're probably like, oh, we can keep him on. Jeez, that, that, that must be um, that must be humbling, eh? Like coming from um, it was. The, being on a on a pedestal on yep. you know the, the world cricket stage and yep. starting at the bottom somewhere else at that age. Yeah, and again, I thought you know that was part of the ethos that was instilled us in the cricket side. And it was promoted strongly by John Graham, particularly was you know, you've got a, you know, you might be the best in the world, but at midnight the clock resets and you get up the next day mm. and you want to be the best in the world again. That's no problem. You go do it again. Yeah. And you got to do it every day. You know, your reputation counts for nothing. You got to get up every day and do it again. Mm. And everybody, everybody starts from zero every morning. And I think that taught us a really strong work ethic and a sense of humility that, you know, we were young guys, right, in our 20s, and we had egos, and, and I had plenty, make no mistake about that. Um, <laughs> you, you did, you, yeah, but my, my sort of, I was trying to think about it yesterday when I was writing these questions, and I suppose you were sort of like the Carlos Spencer of cricket, like you, you just well, that's had this, a very flattering comparison. You, you had this, <laughs> no, this, that you were just a precocious talent, and you were good looking, and young, and you had this sort of arrogance about you, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I look back on it now, and it's it's just embarrassing, right? Um, oh, is it though? But. Yeah, I think it is, you know. In like what way? I, like, you were very good. Uh, well, I had my moments, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Um, but I think, I look back at the way that I behaved on numerous occasions, which was just immature, right? Simple as that. Um, and oh, I are, think, you, are you talking on-field or off-field? Uh, both. Right, right. But, but more so off-field. Yeah. Um, on-field, you know, the rules were the rules, and, you know, you could pretty much do what you like. And I I was always, I was aggressive on, on the field, and, and I played my part right but I think a lot of this also is you know particularly in that environment I, I, I had a role to play and I took on this caricature which is not me right uh, I didn't know that at the time but mm. I was obviously very combative highly aggressive um, and you know a bit of an enforcer on the field um, and that was kind of the role that I needed to play in the team um, and and I'm still now just starting to understand some of this stuff and deal with it but you know like I don't get into conflict situations I don't mm. you know, I don't have arguments with people I'm not aggressive and combative I'm a terrible negotiator you know I mean I don't mm. do that in our business um, there's plenty of guys who are good at that I don't because I just mm. give into people yeah. um, <laughs> which is exactly yeah. the opposite to what I used to be so I took on this role in the team and I thought genuinely thought that's who I was Turns out I'm nothing like that, right? Mm. Um, and I've learned that over the past twenty years. Um, mm. But do you think maybe you, you, that that is who you were at the time, and you've just evolved and shaped and grown as a person between I then think and absolutely. now? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think in the same way that I kind of grew out of cricket would be how I sort of describe what my decision to retire at quite a young age. I literally just grew out of it. Um, I think over the past twenty years, I've probably sort of grown out of that. You know, sort of highly aggressive, arrogant. Um, um, 
sort of persona that I had, mm. and I think a lot of it was insecurity. You know, I didn't yeah. have, I didn't have any experience. I had talent and ability. I had a really strong work ethic. Those were my weapons. Um, but I was playing against, you know, the, what, what I did for a living when I, particularly when I was batting high in the order, was I just played against the best players in the world, who were all five, ten years older than me. Mm -hmm. had much more experience and it was now that I look back on it I never thought about it at the time it was just a mismatch mm. you know like me going up when I was batting three for New Zealand I was 25 um, I wasn't even a specialist batsman um, and all I did was face you know the 15 best bowlers in, in, mm. uh, in history that's all I did right I didn't face anybody else I just mm. faced the best and yeah, to, true, to, true. to sort of bridge that gap you know I needed to find something mm. and they were all five years older than me right you know, like when I was facing Wazim Akram and Wakar Yunus, you know, I was 25. They were in their early 30s. They were at their absolute peak. Mm -hmm. I was still learning the game. Um, it's just a mismatch, right? Yeah. Um, and so for me to be able to beat them and, and compete against them, I needed to find something to bridge the gap. It was arrogance. It was... <laughs> it's probably that youthful I mean, arrogance. You probably yeah. need that to get you through. What else have I got? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, were, you, I, were, you, were you a sledger? Were oh, you yeah. Yeah, yeah, were you? Because you're, you're right behind the wickets. Yeah, you're right no, behind the batsman. I, yeah. was, I was, and that was part of my, that was part of my own sort of mental discipline. Like I, w I remember when, uh, when I started to lose concentration, I would literally just pick a scrap with someone <laughs> to get myself focused. You know, I'd just literally walk past and clock the guy or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and no, I used to do it deliberately. Um, and th but that was part of me. You know being able to maintain my levels of performance. So was this the time before there were like microphones on the stumps? I don't have microphones, but oh, used to, right. I just used to put my phone oh, yeah. over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, these loopholes. Yeah, yeah, no, I knew all yeah. the tricks, right? Um, um, yeah, so, so speaking of like facing these these bowlers, there was um, an incident I found on YouTube uh, from 2000 where Brett Lee, the Aussie fast bowler, hit you on there. It was a crazy incident. Yeah. So you get hit on the helmet with like a, a bouncer and somehow... It, uh, Undoes your chin strap and the helmet falls off and hits the wickets. Yeah, and and you and you get out. So that, that that's done has done that incident. But I, I just want to know from someone that's never been hit in the head with a cricket ball from <laughs> one of the world's fastest bowlers. Like, what's you, it like? Are you yeah? Are you stunned at that point? Oh yeah, it's like a four story building falling down on top of you. Um, yeah, like you literally that one there just literally snapped the chin strap. Um, and I, I just remember my head just vibrating right, literally seeing double. Um, I think it was Mark War who, you know, very graciously came up to right behind me and told me to fuck off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then pointed which way the stand was, <laughs> which was quite helpful because I had no idea. Right? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Is it, uh, you, you see the clip and it looks like you're aware of what's going on and you're sort of standing on the ground, but were you just bewildered? Dazed and confused. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, so. Did they do like concussion checks or anything? Or? They didn't back then, but I, yeah. I definitely ended up with a few sort of mild concussions, no question about that. Um, mm. And plenty of cuts and scars, like all through my eyebrows and eyes. You can sort of, if you have a good close look, there's a fair bit of work up there. Oh, I thought they were Botox scars. No, no. They're, no they're, <laughs> they're battle wounds. Um, and what are your uh, um, recollections or, or thoughts of like New Zealand cricket in the 90s? You know, uh, ego drip. There, there was the weed. Were you there when the weed incident happened? I was on that tour, but I actually wasn't. Um, I'd I'd left uh, to go to. Du I was in Durban. The rest of the team was in Cape Town. I had I had a week off. Yeah. Um, so, so who, who was that? Wasn't. That was Dion Nash. I think it was Flem Nashy. Don't want to get anybody into trouble here. who wasn't involved. <laughs> oh, um, but bygones. It's such a long. And there was a couple of others. I forget exactly who th they were. This was such a big thing at the time, eh? It was but huge. It was. It was. It was. And everybody just assumed I was involved. Right? I was, <laughs> Yeah, when you hear it, it's, it's got like, to be Perori and Ken's must be there. <laughs> I wasn't even in the city, right? Um, <laughs> so I got tagged for that one. But yeah. um, no, I, I actually, to be fair, if I was there, I probably would have been in <laughs> Yeah, um, well, um, there's a, a great podcast that a couple of friends of mine do called Between Two Beers, and they've had Dion Nash on, and he talked uh, in length about that incident. Yeah. And like the, the the backlash and the treatment for those three guys afterwards, it was just alarming. It was really. pretty brutal, right? Yeah, like um, served legal papers just before playing a game, like shortly after yeah. that back in New Zealand. I mean, yeah, uh, it was it was all like I don't, I don't know how they had the resilience or strength to get through it. It seems like it was such a tough time for all three of them. Yeah, I remember a little bit about it. Um, uh, you I, just must have been relieved it wasn't oh, you. Oh, I was delighted, right? Was like, oh, thank, <laughs> thank God for that. <laughs> thank God I wasn't there. I Sorry you guys are going through this, but... Whew. Yeah, yeah. if I had been there, I'm sure I would have been right in the yeah. thick of it, right? Um, 
um, because uh, we were we were all mates, right? Like mm. if it was one and all in, and that's that was the ethos of it. That was the culture. Mm. Um, so yeah, no, I'm pretty sure. I think I d- ducked a bullet that time. Mm. And um, you, what are your um, reflections or memories of Martin Crow? I know he was like quite a good friend and mentor of yours, and you never got to beat his dad in tennis. He was very very good to me. Like yeah. um, on that first tour to England in in ninety nine and eighty nine. Um, <laughs> um, he sort of took me under my wing. Like I was 19, I'm very young 19. The rest of the team was like a mature Black Caps team, you know. They were all well into their mid-30s. I played my first test with Sir Richard. He was 40. Um, I didn't have a lot in common with those guys, right? Mm. Um, and so I was sort of – and I didn't drink. Um, and at those days the culture was very much around, you know, drinking. So I was, didn't fit in. Um, and But Crowey took me under his wing – taught me how to play, so he spent a lot of time in the nets with me at the end of the game, um, during the during the county games. Yeah, you know, so, he, so he was like a senior player, and you were like a... Yep, a he was vice like captain, I think, and best player in the world. Yeah. And, um, Why did he do that? Just because he saw I potential think, in you, I think or he you... Saw, I think he saw a lot of himself and his early experiences in me, mm. and so he did what he, whatever he could to mitigate it. We became very, very close friends um, over a number of years, and... You know, we had our moments too. I disagreed with him on occasions, and so we had a few blues. And you know, he'd get puppy and wouldn't talk to me for three or four months. And <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, about, oh, yeah. what, about what sort of yeah. things? Oh, I can't remember the exact details of it now, but it was one of those sort of big brother, little brother yeah, relationships, right, very right. much. Where, you know, we could have a genuine disagreement about things, and he'd be, you know, severely pissed off and not talk to me for a few months. Um, and I'd know I was in dog box, but eventually, you know, we'd sort of patch it up. Time heals. Um, isn't it funny? The, the passage of time, isn't it funny? So whatever it was, yeah. it was probably massive at the time, but you, all these years pass and it, it just seems insignificant, whatever yeah, it was. Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah. Um, you know, I think, and I, I look back very fondly with uh, at those memories. Um, Mark Greatbatch was another one who along with Martin, spent a lot of time with me early mm. in my career and was a, you know, these guys were my heroes. I yeah. grew up watching them on TV and all of a sudden I'm actually in the dressing room sitting right next to them and got to go play with them. Um, it was a big stretch. And then so to be included and made welcome by those guys and to develop friendships. Patty and I are still mates to this day. We play golf once or twice a year. Do you really? Um, yeah. I love that guy. Yeah. He's one of my favourite cricketers, especially when he was fielding. He was just, he was a big guy, but he was so nimble in the field, wasn't he? Yeah, and aggressive and, you know, just had that, that, that epitome. And I wanted to be like them, right? Mm. I, I copied them. Um, and so those friendships, they last a lifetime. Mm. Um, and they're still on foot now. Yeah, Martin Crow's no longer with us. Can you remember your last interaction with him or the last time you saw him? Um, yeah, I can. He came to my office just up the road here in Freeman's Bay. Um, uh, came in and he, towards the end, he used to come in quite regularly, probably once every three or four months. So this and is when, was, he was, when he was sick? Yep, yep. Yeah, when he was sick. And he would just come in and hang out with us. Dion was sharing the office with me at that stage with his triumph and disaster business. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we were there. There were occasions when I think Kenzie was in there as well. And Crow would just come in for a morning and hang out. Um, and I remember, yeah, that was sort of towards the end. So that's probably my most recent memories of him, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, very sad that we lost him so early. Still a sad day, you know. Um, I think I was in Bali earlier this year, and um, it was it was the, the anniversary of Martin passing, and I, I messaged Patty just saying, you know, I'm feeling a bit sad that we lost our mate. Um, mm. So the guys still feel it. We all still feel it. It was a big yeah. loss for us. Yeah. Um, yeah, so who are, you, who are you still mates with? Uh, Mark Graybatch, obviously. Dion Nash? Still see Patty. Dion and I, very close. Um Actually, Dion, uh, Kenzie, and Tomo and I have a sort of a reasonably regular um, Zoom call um, that's sort of hopefully fortnightly, but certainly once a month if all of us all get together. Um, and then I bang into a, a whole bunch of the other guys um, on occasions. We all end up in the celebrity golf tournaments, Dipak, Trevor Franklin, Paddy, Scotty Styrus, um, all the golfers. Yeah. Um, so catch up with uh, those guys a couple of times a year. That's normally a pretty big mm. night. Um, mm. And then the Black Clash is a great opportunity for us all to get together. The guys, mm. are, we love that, right? Yeah. Um, that's really good fun. So those friendships, they last a lifetime, right? They, yeah. they really do. Yeah, and I, I get the feeling from you, you're um, a fiercely um, loyal sort of person, you know, the, the sort of person that um, 
I think I saw this on a Lance Armstrong, you know, Lance Armstrong, the mm, cyclist. I yeah. uh, saw a documentary with him and he talked about when shit hits the fan, you have people that lean in and people that lean out. I feel like you're a sort of person that leans in. Um, were, you, were, were you leaning in, leaning out, or just like standing straight when Kenzie's been going through his um, scandals over the years? Oh, definitely leaning in. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, um, I mean, I probably won't talk about my feelings around how all that went because it's a, it's a really difficult topic because I've got friends on both sides, mm. like very close friends. Um, and, yes, yeah, so I've got my own views on that. But also, um, you know, Kenzie's been very good to a lot of us over the years, right? Um, uh, and I sort of, yeah, no, you're right, Dom. Like, I'm fiercely loyal and I think just because somebody makes a mistake... Um, uh, you know, that doesn't sort of cancel everything else out that's yeah. going on. Um, and I think that that particular incident was very, very challenging for the for the black caps for the black um, caps mm. group. Um, and you know, I think uh, it's been pleasing to see that a bit of time and a little bit of water under the bridge has softened what were some pretty intense feelings yeah. um, and pretty difficult things for us all to deal with. Right? Mm. Um, it was not easy, and you know, trying to sort of be supportive of everybody that was involved was was not an easy thing to do, mate. Um, yeah. But I think my 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 feelings to Christopher um, have always been pretty clear. You know, we had a great ride on his coattails, mm. all of us, um, and the view was pretty good. So, mm. um, yeah, yeah, he was an exceptional player. Yeah. I just noticed you called him Christopher. Do you call him Christopher? No. Yeah, I do on occasion. Yeah, yeah, on yeah. occasions. <laughs> Sounds like he's in trouble. <laughs> Normally, he <Yeah>. is. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, um, that's probably enough about the cricket. Um, I'm mindful of the, uh, the the time we've got here with you today, and there's uh, it's been such a like a rich tapestry of a life, and there's so much to get through. But, um like there's the, the business stuff, the personal side of Adam Peroy, but the Everest stuff is something that um, I'm immensely interested in. So on May 20, 20, 2011, you um, made it to the summit of Mount Everest. And actually, uh, I had an interview with you a few days after that, I think back at base camp on my radio show. Yep. Yep. It's one of the worst interviews ever. Your, your voice was gone. Like you, you yeah. had you had very little voice left, but I, I appreciated the opportunity to speak to you. And actually, you're the first person, and maybe the only person we'll ever have on the podcast that has summited Mount Everest. So, w- where where did this come from? So you finished cricket, spent a bit yep. of time in business. Then, how do you get into mountain climbing? Just a very strange um, turn of events. Uh, my brother-in-law, um, just who I hadn't seen for about eight years, just happened to turn out to be a high altitude guide. He was on his way to Everest. Gave me a call. Caught up with him, having sort of lost touch with him for quite a few years and um, and then when he got back from Everest I think he guided um, for Himex in 2010 and so when Johnny um, Johnny Davison when he got back from Everest he you know I didn't have much to do that winter and he said why don't you come for a climb with me so we went down to Queenstown and you know had a couple of nights um, socialising and then sort of went up into the mountains and he sort of 101 me we climbed the Remarkables and went out to Y Creek and did some ice climbing and you know just did the you know, the basics. So th- this is your first time with like crampons and a yep, pack? And yep, yeah, first yeah. time out. Um, learned how to, you know, run a tent and do all that sort of stuff in the snow and just kind of fell in love with it. Um, and then he sort of said, why don't you climb Everest with me next year? And I said, well, I've always sort of wanted to. Have you? Yeah. Had you in the back yeah, of Yeah, sort of, but I was scared, I was afraid. Mm, um, mm. Like I remember when we were in India, we flew past it a couple of times uh, on our way to Guwahati. And it's above you when you fly past, right? Mm. Um, yeah, 8,000 or something metres. So pretty spectacular. Yeah. And um, I'd read all the books, you know, into thin air and all that sort of stuff. So I was fascinated by it, but obviously terrified, which is normal. Um, and then all of a sudden, then here was an opportunity and a bit of a pathway to actually do it. And I was uh, separated from Sally at the time and single and sort of in a bit of a no man's land and emotionally in quite a good place for that. And so I decided I'd give it a crack. Um and so I climbed sort of semi-professionally for about 18 months, learning the ropes, basically. Mm. Went to the Himalaya uh, previously in October of 2010 and climbed another of the 8,000-metre peaks called Manaslu. And that got me into the swing of the Himex um, program. I got to meet um, Woody, who's still my climbing partner to this day. Russell Bryce, who runs Himex and is, is a legend, an icon, particularly on Everest. Um, you know, he's sort of Mr. Everest. And got a got a bit of a view into the team, and these guys are the best in the world, right? Mm. So, I, and I immediately felt quite comfortable in that environment. A lot of it was very familiar. The routine of it was quite similar to being in a cricket team, but scarily similar. Um, mm. And I hadn't been involved in that environment for. 
10 years at that stage. Like when I finished playing sport, I literally had nothing. I literally walked out of the dressing room and it was like turning a, a light switch off. Um, and I had nothing to do with anybody in cricket for 10 years. Like nothing. Um, was that necessary on your part to have like sort of that sort of break or that sort of break up, if you like? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure what that was about, but yeah. I look back on it now, and it looks to me like that was a bit of a trauma response. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I'm still sort of trying to figure some of the stuff out, Dom. To be honest, because mm. um, that's yeah. not normal, right? Like that is not normal behaviour. Um, uh, Such a big part of your life, but maybe yeah. it felt necessary to do that. Uh, I, 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 know. Obviously, I obviously have you did, had any right? therapy or anything? Yeah. Have yeah. you? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, has this come up? What yeah. do yeah, they yeah, say about it? Some of the stuff that we're sort of trying to figure out. Like yeah, yeah, you're still in the process yeah, of... I'm in the process. So I do I, well, I have um, therapy once a week on a Wednesday, 10.30. Mm. I've been doing it for two years, 18 months. So you're right, um, so you only started sort of when you were 50-ish. Yeah. 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 Uh, why did it take you so long? Was it nerves? Was it fear? No, I've always sort of... Um, you know, I've had relationship counselling at various times over the years, yeah. obviously. Um, and then suddenly thought, actually... Because I always quite enjoyed it. It's quite good to have a professional third-party adjudicator. <laughs> Especially when they're taking your side. <laughs> it's like, well, that's... I mean, that's good. I mean, I've always sort of responded quite well to authority. Yeah, like, yeah. I push the boundaries a little bit. But mm. when a, when somebody in authority tells me what the rules are, I quite like that. Yeah. I so, feel quite so you safe. Know, yeah. with, you know, like, I'll go all the way to the line, but I respect... <laughs> <laughs> um, so I found that sort of quite comfortable um, and then a natural extension of it was that I'd go away and do some work on myself because mm. I felt like I needed to um, and this sort of stuff came up in those sessions um, mm. and it wasn't being brought up by Anna who looks after me but um, it was stuff that I sort of started to figure out about myself and I'd say to her, listen, you know, when I finished playing cricket, this is what happened um, and, I, and I remember saying to her, I said, that is not normal. Um, so, yeah, we're starting to get into all that stuff, mm. um, which is great, right? Like trying to figure out, you know, the way that you behaved as a young man, like what the hell was that about? Because um, it's quite different to the way I behave now. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It just gives you a new perspective and a new way of looking at things. So yeah. I really like it. Well, anyway, back to the Everest thing. So you, how much does it cost to climb, you, to, to get in with a good climbing group? Is it like big yeah. money, 50 grand? No, no, it's about, I, I reckon it's about 100 um, <sighs> to go on those, you know, those a full guided, noise premium yeah. guided expeditions. But that gives you safety. So it's the best weather forecasting, it's the best guides, it's lots of Sherpas, it's the best food. Um, it's really the full, you know, the super platinum service. Mm. Um, you can do it a lot cheaper. Um, I mean, if I was going back to K2, I could probably do that on for you 50 I reckon um, but I wouldn't be part of a guided expedition I'd take Woody um, and we'd just build out our own infrastructure and we'd climb it without a big group just yeah. the two of us we'd still have Sherpa support and all that um, but I think and now that I'm more experienced I can do that um, um, but also I've had plenty of time in these mountains you mm. know climbing on my own um, uh, I've had a few pretty interesting experiences doing that um, so that's quite different. Have you? Now. Like what? What do you mean? Like, uh, like you know, the scary calls? Yeah, or? yeah. I've almost yeah. killed myself Have three, you? three times. Yeah, yeah. How? Um, what does that look like on a mountain? Uh, on Everest, the first time, uh, probably Manasloo was the first time where you know we were pretty exposed at eight thousand meters um, the night before, and and the wind changed. Just you know, the the it just it blew. Yeah. Um, blew a hundred miles an hour at four in the morning, which is pretty terrifying. Um, you know, at that stage you're told to get dressed, um, which is, you know, you're literally in the middle of nowhere, mm. 8,000 metres, it's pitch black, right? Um, and I was sort of like, why am I getting dressed? They were like, because we might be outside soon. Um, <laughs> oh, isn't the tent's just blowing away? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Um, do you know, get dressed? It's like, ooh. <laughs> okay. Um, and it's noisy, right? Like, it's like being inside a 747, you're in a two-man tent, which is, you know, sort of, this tiny, big, tiny little dome, and yeah. it, suddenly it's flat, right? Like it's literally hitting you in the face. Um, so you're in the middle of all that, trying to get dressed, which is not that easy to do. You got down suits and all the rest of it. Um, so that was sort of the first, uh, sort of you know, if it had blown another 20, 30 miles an hour, which I thought it was going to, you know, you just get blown off the mountain, right? That's mm. the end of it. Um, the wind stopped, and we summited four hours later. Um, but that was the first time where I suddenly went, hey, do you know what? I might be a bit buggered here, um, mm. and there's nothing I can do about out it. Of right? your, out of your depth. Um, but at, at, at the time, you're thinking, oh, I suppose at the time, you're just in the moment, and you not don't think until afterwards, like, fuck, that was a close call. Yeah. I mean, I got maniacally calm, right? Like, I just made my peace with it. I was like, mm. well, it's not up to you anymore. 
Mm. Um, That's part of that, you think, because you're good under pressure as well from years as... Well, I do tend to do that, right? Yeah. As the pressure ratchets up, I, I do get maniacally calm. I go the other way. Um, which I think was why I was always pretty good under pressure playing cricket because mm. that's my natural instinct. I, generally speaking, don't freak out. Um, I tend to go the other way, yeah, naturally, and that's been the case with the mountaineering as well. Um, Everest, I got stuck in a massive collapse in the ice fall, um, which was just stupid. And what does it does it mean? You're walking along and the the, the ice just disappears beneath you. Yeah. So we were trying to sneak through. It was after our first failed summit attempt, and there were three of us: Woody, David Tate, myself. Four of us, and Adrian Ballinger, senior guide, um, and we were trying to sneak through so we could get back to base camp so we can get an extra day's rest because we knew the next weather window was six days away. Mm-hmm. And we were in the ice fall in the evening at six in the evening, which is just stupidity, right? Like there's an amateur mistake. And uh, the ice just collapsed. And when I say the ice collapsed, an area literally three metres behind me, the size of a football field, just disappeared, like literally disappeared. And the ice that we were on just started moving like this. like It was like being in Donkey Kong. Oh, um, my God. And so my bit went up, and uh, David Tate was in front of me. Um, he went down, and his bit of ice, block of ice, they were about the size of this room, um, about four metres by three metres they were, and they all just started moving. David's one split in half, and he fell over. Um, so I thought that he's gone, and all I could think of was just stay on your feet. If you stay on your feet, you're a chance. So I'm literally surfing these blocks of ice. <laughs> we can laugh about it now. It's like, holy oh shit. Um, and it moved probably, I don't know, four or five metres, I reckon, with me on it. Oh. Um, and so that was, and then we saw the size of the collapse behind us. And when I say behind us, like literally two metres behind oh. us just disappeared, right? How far um, down did it drop? Oh, a kilometre. Um, yeah, it just vanished, right? Gone. Um it took them three days to repair the route after we got back, put it that way. It was a big collapse. Um, and the noise of it, like you could hear it underneath. It was like a 747 mm. starting up underneath you. I'll never forget the sound. Um, and the, we, we survived. We got lucky, right? Mm. Dead lucky. Um, so, th- so the, yeah, that wasn't, um, that, that wasn't human error or an altitude problem, no, no, altitude it's sickness? It's or called or stupidity. <laughs> But, but and these guys are the best climbers in the world, right? Which yeah, is how so, you so stu- stupidity that you could not have avoided. Stupidity or that we just shouldn't have been in the ice fall at six o'clock at night. Okay, gotcha. Everybody knows that, right? right. Literally, it's a, it's a, it's a. Well, how did these guys let it happen? Because when you get under pressure, you make mistakes, right? Right. Yeah, right. we were trying it. We took a chance, and with hindsight, it's just a stupid error. But mm. that's how the best mountaineers in the world get killed. Right. The mountain. There's a saying: the mountain doesn't know you're an expert. Um, and you look at you look at all the best climbers; um, they get killed by making amateur mistakes, mm. um, and it happens over and over and over again. Right. Wow. See, at, at that point, why why do you keep going? Why don't you sit in your tent that night and go? Actually, this isn't for me. Is it because you'd come too far? No, I think at that stage you just realise that you just made a mistake, right? It was right. just a stupid mistake. And so, part of what you do as a climber um, is you manage risk. And that was just a poor decision, mm. simple as that. It doesn't mean you're going to make another poor decision. It's just count yourself lucky that you survived it. And don't, don't pull, do pull it your head again. in, don't do it again. Don't do it again, right? Yeah. Um, so reassess your risk parameters and, you know, just count yourself lucky. Yeah. So then the, um, the, so the day you climb to the mountain, you, you get out of bed at midnight or something and you start climbing? So yeah, you're well, at, no, so that day actually starts at 7,300 metres at Camp 3. So you're up at... Six. So there's base camp, then camp one, camp two, two camp three. Camp, camp three's halfway up the Lotsey face. Okay. It's at 7,300. Um, What's the summit? 8,000? 8,848. Okay, so it's like a K and a half That's up. a fair okay. way to go. Yeah. It's a big yeah. day. Um, so you get out of your tent that morning, you climb the Lotsey face, and then uh, you traverse across, um, uh, and then you end up at um, camp four, which is 8,000. So that takes most of the day. You get into uh, camp four at about lunchtime, um, rest for the afternoon, and then you leave for the summit at midnight. That morning, you're supposed to put your oxygen on, or we were supposed to put our oxygen on at 7,300. I, I get out, and I'm climbing the face reasonably well, but I'm sort of a bit sluggish. Um, uh, there's a couple just of guys, the altitude? Or? Well, I thought it was just altitude, right? Oh, um, yep. There's a couple of guys who I normally climb faster than were sort of going far past me, which I thought was a bit unusual. I wasn't feeling my best, but I still felt okay. Um, hands were really cold, and then I get to top of the Lotsey face at 8,000 metres, and I sort of thought, better just check my oxygen. 
and I'd forgotten to turn it on, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a classic example of being hypoxic, right? Like all of those signs, the cold hands should have been an absolute giveaway. Um, the fact that I was feeling a little bit sluggish, and particularly when other guys are climbing faster than you, that should have said to me, mate, check your oxygen. Mm. But because I was hypoxic, I didn't think that my brain just wasn't working, right? So I climbed all the way to 8,000 with no O's, and then I went. Shit, well, that's quite good because <laughs> you got heaps more than I, the others. I've got lots of oxygen. I'm feeling all right. Then I'm going, shit, if I arrive at Camp 4 with you know a heap of oxygen, I'm going to get told off. Um, so I thought, right, I'll just crank it right up <laughs> and burn it off, right? <laughs> so I did, and I forget what the leaderage was, but I turned it to maximum, mate. I just turned into Superman, right? Like I was going far, I was passing the Sherpas, uh, literally. Like it was unbelievable, the difference. Mm. Um, so I got into Camp 4 with a little more oxygen than I should have, but sort of managed to get away with it. But um, the difference between no O's and O's at altitude, like, different thing, right? Yeah, Completely different. Remarkable. Thing. And do, do, you, do you pass, is it just a, like an urban myth, or do you pass, like, bodies encased in ice on the way? Oh, no, no, that's all there. Is um, it? Yeah, 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 that's a thing. Um, and then there's... Uh, uh, what they call Rainbow Valley, which is at the bottom of the, I think it's Kangsheng face, which is climbers that have fallen down there. That's the, the down suits. So you go over Rainbow Valley. Um, How many bodies are we talking? Uh, depends on the snow conditions. Right. But when it's quite dry, like our year was quite dry, not a lot of snow. Um, I think we saw three or four. Um, and also they're kind of, like the track's sort of that wide, right? And it's yeah, like, well, like half a metre, say about a kilometre and a half oh. straight down on that side, and then you know it's yeah, that side's China. So um, the the sort of the joke is that you're better off falling down the Kangsheng face because you'll live longer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's about two k's down on that side. <laughs> I suppose you have to laugh about it, don't you? Need well, the mountaineers have pretty black humour, right? Right. Um, I suppose it's necessary. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's sort of a part of it. And were you were you educated on what to do if you see someone on the way that's struggling, and you, yep. are you supposed to just walk past them? Well, it's kind of every man for himself, right? Um, yeah, which dog eat dog. Is sort of not really my ethos, to be honest. But there's you're pretty limited there. what you yeah. can do, right? Um, yeah. You know, it, it really is hard getting yourself down because um, hypoxia at... I didn't really notice it until I got sort of above the Hillary step um, but and certainly above the South Summit, which is about 8,600 metres, I reckon. And at that stage, I was, even with oxygen, I was quite out of it. Mm. Um, and you get clumsy, like really clumsy. Um, and normally my feet are pretty good, but I was suddenly pretty sloppy with my footwork. You know, it, it's a thing. Um, particularly right at that last little bit. And there's not a lot of room, mate. Yeah. Like literally, the track's this wide. You've got you know a big cornice on this side, and over that is China. And this side, you know, it's just the... That's the, the I think it's Kangsheng face. Mm. Um, so, so you get to the summit, then what? Is it just a photo and then get the fuck out of there? No, no, I was up there for about 20 minutes. Really? Yeah. Doing what? Just hanging out with and having a look. Um, <laughs> and it was the weather was perfect, right? Uh, so I was literally had my down suit all unzipped. I was in a t shirt, 6 a.m. No was, way. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I was, see, I sort of imagined, um, okay, so you can take your gloves off and take yeah. some photos. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, beautiful yeah. up there, right? There was not a breath of wind. Um, you can see, literally, you can see the curvature of the earth. You can see for. Earth's flat, mate. Well, <laughs> I can tell you it's not. <laughs> I've seen it with my own eyes. Yeah, it's wow. definitely around. Well, it um, sounds like you've got a good and day. the sky is sort of bluey black because you're basically on the edge of the atmosphere and we had a crack a day. Um, mm. And then so I messed around up there, waited for a few of the other guys to catch up, took some photos. Um, and then I had this really strange sensation. It's probably one of the most powerful physical sensations I've ever felt, which is, you know, we need to go down now. Um, and it was sort of quite, yeah, I'll never forget how that felt. It was like, this is great. We don't belong here. We need to go down mm. Um, and so that yeah, that was my time on the summit. Oh, that sounds incredible. Yeah, yeah, it was a pretty cool experience. What um, what do you think means more, like um, climbing Everest or some of your cricket achievements, like playing New Zealand, playing for New Zealand for the first time when Quite you were a teenager? Different things, right? Really? Um, yeah. Uh, the cricket stuff was always something that you celebrated quite outwardly, whereas the mountaineering is very inward. Um, but I never talk about it, right? Ever. That's why to be able to talk about it with you is I, I enjoy it, but it's just mm. not something that I talk about. Um, why? Because you're a, you're constantly looking forward to the guy, or I don't think so. I, I think th it's just uh, the experience is so personal, and 
there's a lot of respect involved with the mountains and with your teammates. Um, you know, uh, on all of these expeditions, uh, some people don't come home, right? Mm. On all of them. Yeah, and um, it's a risk. It's a risk for yeah, everyone that goes. So I think you're very conscious of that and being very respectful to the people that, that are still in the mountains. Mm. Um, and it's just, it's a very inward, personal sort of experience um, and not something that I sort of really talk about. Not, not sure why. It's just, but I've noticed over the years quite a different thing, right? But it's something that so few people do, so there must be so much curiosity around it. I, like, I don't bring it up, obviously, and um, occasionally when it comes up, I'm happy to talk about mm. it, but um, it doesn't come, honestly, it doesn't come up much. Yeah. Um, so for that 20 minutes on the summit, what do you, uh, can you remember what you were thinking at the time? I was buggered, man. <laughs> <laughs> I was dead tired, thinking, holy shit, that's halfway, I've got to get down. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah. But is, is it easier going down, though? Like, no, it's, uh, well, it's so easier. It's just as technical. Uh, but it's it's tricky, yeah, and, it, and yeah. it's really physically hard on your knees and your feet. Um, mm. um, and also, it's scary, right? Going down is quite scary. Like trying Because by definition, you're overtaking people. You've got people coming up, so you need to be on and off the ropes all the time. Which is a bit precarious. Oh, I didn't think about that. Yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah, ah. and some of them are well. Everybody going the other way. You don't know who they are, and some of them are you know sort of more capable than others. Um, so there's a lot of sort of um, there's a lot of risk on the way down. Third party risk in terms of safely navigating your way down. Just having um, you explain it like that, it's probably amazing. The uh, the death rate on the mountains is not higher than what it is. Yeah, well, seems I, like I'm a... I'm surprised. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of people up there who have no right to be in there. Mm. On, on Everest particularly, not not so much on K2, but even there, there's a few that probably shouldn't have been there. Mm. So at what point do you do you, do you realise, th- I've done it and I'm going to live? Uh, Is it when you get to the, that um, <laughs> Camp 4 that you were talking about? or Yeah, probably by that stage, most, the, the significant, yeah, when you get down to Camp 4, you kind of, you're out of the worst of it, I think. Yeah. The altitude, you're feeling better with every step. Um, like you genuinely feel stronger as you descend, like that is definitely a thing. Mm. Um, and then by the time you get to camp four, you're sort of through the worst of it, and it's you've got a bit of work to do still. Right. So you're not tobogganing down to base camp. <laughs> no, no, you're walking. Um, so I think for us, I mean, my timings, and if you compare this to some of the the tragic stories up there, was we left for the summit at twelve, we were on the summit at six a.m. I was in camp four by nine a.m. And back at Camp 2 by lunchtime. Wow, what a day. Yeah. Um, and you compare this to some of the stories where you've got guys who are still, you know, haven't even reached the South Summit at 3 in the afternoon. Right, because they're in a line of, line of they're human traffic. Or they're not fast enough right, or whatever. Right. Um, the, queues, the queues are, in my opinion, very dangerous. Mm. Um, and I'm surprised that there's not more issues around that. Yeah. But wow. we, like that night... Um, so we climbed off the ropes. There's a portion early on in the climb called the Triangle Face, just below the balcony. Um, and there was a big... I've got photos of the, the, the lights up there, the queue. So we didn't. We came off the ropes and free climbed the Triangle Face um, wow. and literally went past everybody. And then we were first. So we had no queues because we were first, but still had to navigate everybody coming back down. Um, but, I, I mean, the way that I typically do that is I will literally come off the ropes and free climb. Right. Um, is that advisable? Or? It just depends on your own level of competence yeah, yeah. and your own ability. But I, for me, I feel uh, prob- I feel safer um, free climbing reasonably easy sections of the mountain as opposed to being on the ropes, which slows me down and then sort of introduces third-party risk in terms of people going yeah. the other way. Um, and I, but I always come from a – I go light and fast – um, and try and get myself through danger quickly, as opposed to you know being completely safe. But I back my ability to stay on my feet. Like yeah. I'm, I'm good on my feet. Um, yeah. But that's a personal decision that everybody makes. Yeah. Wow. What an accomplishment. Chi, I just looked at the time. We've been going for an hour. For you um, promised me an hour of your time. Are you, are you in a hurry? Or can we keep uh, no. No. That's good time. Let's keep going. I'm quite oh, enjoying yeah. it. You enjoying um, it? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I really appreciate absolutely. you being here because um, I said to you before you came in, I. I search your name on um, podcast platforms and it's not something you do a lot. You're a relatively private and personal guys these days, yes. guy these days, which I'm guessing is by choice. Yeah, yeah. so I sort of made that decision um, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, Why is uh, that? You just have a guts full of being... Cause you were you were like um, a tabloid fodder. You, you were in the Women's Weekly or Women's Day or New Idea every other week. Yeah, I just had enough of being exposed to everybody and everybody having an opinion um, and... Uh, I, I did certainly feel the brunt of the tall poppy syndrome, mm. um, which 
and I've sort of started to understand that a little bit more. It's just a cute name that we as New Zealanders have dreamed up so we can bully people. Um, mm. It's as simple as that. And I think as certainly as f- when it's directed towards young people, and typically they're sports people or high-profile entertainers or whatever, it's quite destructive, right? Um, and I, I was sort of, in my era, you know, if you have a little bit of success, you were told to just harden up, um, which... I don't think is particularly helpful for either young men or young women. Absolutely um, not. And you can also shrug and say, oh, it comes with the territory, yeah, you, but that's another cop out. You know, it's yeah, like, actually, yeah. no, 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 I don't agree with that, right? Yeah. You know, just because you're good at playing tennis or you can sing well mm. um, and you've had some success commercially, um, that doesn't mean that people have got a right to line up and pull you down. I, mean, yes. I, I just don't buy into that, right? It's just bullying. It's terrible. Do you, do you think it's um, still as bad here in New Zealand? Do you think it's got better or is it much the same? I, I don't know because I haven't had any personal experience yeah. of it because I've been invisible for 15 years. Um, yeah. And that's not by accident. I just got sick and tired of just people chipping me. Because mm. um, it hurts, so I, right? It does. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, uh, so I just made a decision that I would just take myself away from that. Mm. Um, and so for the last, certainly for the last decade, you know, if you don't actually know me, mm. you know, I could probably count on one hand the number of people that have had thirty minutes with me. Mm. Um, I, I just don't, I just don't do that anymore. Yeah, um, yeah, it's funny because I, I had um, um, Matthew Ridge on the podcast in the middle of last year, and when when he was at the peak of his fame, he had the ultimate. Um, I don't give a fuck attitude mm. and um, we, he was sitting in the same chair as what you are and we sat down and talked about this and, and um, even he admitted it fucking stings yeah. and it hurts oh, mate, you know, it feels like <laughs> shit right no matter who you yeah, are yeah. Mm-hmm. there's that sticks and stones saying that I was you, you're about the same age as me you probably heard it as well my parents taught me sticks and stones may break my bones but names will never hurt me but it's utter bullshit it is. name calling does it hurt um, so you yeah, so you um, Speaking of Matthew Rich, so so he was married to Sally, and then you you started seeing Sally after that. You got a couple of couple of kids together. Um, how I, I remember watching the TV show Game of Two Halves, and mm. there was your name would come up from time to time. Was that a was that a frosty time, I, or was 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 Matthew and Sally like well and truly over, and you were, you guys were good? Uh, they were over. Matthew was pretty protective of Jamie and Bossy, obviously. Right. Um, and I didn't know Matthew until I met Sally, mm. um, and then obviously I got to know Matthew. Um, and uh, over the years, we became best mates. Mm. Um, he was very much like a big brother to me. Um, like he'd give me a bit of a hard time, but he sort of didn't put up with anybody else doing it. Mm. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it's like a big, yeah, it's like a big brother. Yeah, yeah no, he, and yeah. Reggie was very, very good to me. Also, I had a huge amount of respect for him. Right, like mm. when I was playing sport, he was the pros pro. Right, he was the highest profile. He was, you know, world class, the best at what he did. Um, you know, maniacal trainer, physically mm. fit, you know, and elite in my view. Yeah. Well, um, you you were talking about how you were earning like two, 200, 250 a year. He was. He said he, he was, was on like eight hundred. No, or he was earning a million bucks wow. a year. Right. He was the first guy I knew was making a million bucks a year. Wow. Um, um, so and so he was on a completely different mm. level to all the rest of us. Um, mm. There was Bridgie, and then there was you know three or four other guys, and I think I was probably in that bracket in terms of profile. Yeah. Um, but he was far and away beyond anybody that I saw, um, and deservedly so, right? Um, mm. And so that was the basis of our relationship. Um, um, and then we became great mates over the years. Um, haven't seen him recently, but I'm looking forward to catching up with him in Europe in a couple of months. Mm. Oh, is that right? You'd, you'd, you'd see him when you're over there. Yeah, yeah well, we've got... Um, yeah, we've got a family event up in Europe later right. on this year. We will all sort of be together, so it'll be nice. Yeah, I I really enjoyed spending time with him. He seems like he's in a really good place. Like quite a quite a zen dude these days. He's bloody hard case. Um, we had so much fun together. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, we had a lot of fun together. Mm. Yeah. So so yeah. So you and you and Sally, when you were together, you're on like the, the cover of like women's magazines every other week. I'm guessing that's because. Um, you, you you sold, you sold magazines. Yeah. Do you? Yeah, we did, and that was Sally's business, right? So yeah. I, I used to just hold up one side of the photo, mm. um, uh, but it sort of wasn't really my thing. Um, yeah, and yeah, we did sell. We sold pretty good, mm. um, but that's that was a different time, you know. Mm. Um, it just was what it was. Uh, not the case anymore, and I think that's probably quite healthy. Yeah. So and you, you so you guys have got a couple of kids together. How old are the kids now? Aston's uh, nineteen. McLean's right. sixteen. Are they doing any sport or anything? Or Aston plays tennis. McLean plays hockey. Yeah. Um, like I never really pushed that. Yeah. Um, I sort of thought if they wanted to play sport, that's great. But you know what? It's a pretty tough way to make a living. Mm. Um, so I've sort of left them to their own devices. Um, yeah. And certainly they both played a little bit of cricket. Um, sort of wasn't really their thing, which suited me because I 
didn't really want to sit around Saturday morning. And watch <laughs> <laughs> didn't really want to watch cricket for three hours on Saturday morning. She's a long game, eh? Yeah. She's a long yeah. game. Ninety five percent of it, which involves watching other other people's kids play. <laughs> I was sort of like, mm. And not at a good <laughs> level by your standards. <laughs> not super excited, and obviously I had to coach, and that sort of doesn't sit that naturally with me. So when they decided that you know to play tennis and hockey, I was delighted. Yeah. So um, what, what, so what happened with you guys? You want to get into it or not? Really? Was it just the pressure of like being such a high profile couple, or Sally and I? Yeah. Um, just I run its course. Think, yeah, I think it just we were together eight to ten years. I yeah. Think. Um, and I just think that it wasn't the perfect match. Obviously, yeah. it just sort of ran its course. Um, we were pretty ambitious, and we took it on a lot of projects. I think that took its toll on the relationship. Um, the friendship was there was no issue there at all, mm. um, and it was a very constructive, successful relationship. Yeah. Um, um, and fortunately, despite that, the, you know, we had a pretty rough period for about five years after it came to an end, which was pretty difficult for everyone. Um, we've sort of put that back together again, and Sally and I have sort of probably in the best place we've ever been, which yeah. is nice. Oh, it's that's good. Great are for you, the kids. And oh, yeah, because you guys... You, actually, Sally's bloody good company, mate. Is she? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I normally go there for dinner once a week, and, um, you know, we get on like a house on fire. Um it's funny yeah, how that, that happens with age. Like when, yeah, cause I, yeah, you said there was a tough time, and yeah, I remember this was splashed through the papers as well, like some court stuff that was going on. When when you're in the thick of that, the eye of that tornado, you must be thinking, I can never sit down in the same room with this person again. Yeah, well, it was like that, right? Yeah, we, we didn't yeah. talk to each other for a while, and it was, you know, it was pretty, it was it was pretty sort of tough times for everybody. Um, but we managed to, with a bit of age and a little bit of maturity, we sort of managed to put it all back together again, and mm. it's. Um, it's yeah, it's been great for the kids particularly. Yeah. You know, what they really like is to, you know, just spend a bit of time with their mum and dad being normal. Yeah. Um, so the, yeah, age, wisdom, the healing power of time as well, I yeah, think. Yeah, a little one. bit of humility and yeah. you know, swallow your pride a little bit goes a long way. Yeah. Leave your ego at the doors for pretty um is a pretty good start. Yeah. So how long are we married? What what do you mean like eight years? Uh, somewhere yeah. between eight and ten yeah. years. Um, I would say that's a good innings, but you're a cricketer, so you know that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think for a marriage, it's it's like people change and evolve all the time, don't you? So yeah, well, you do. Uh, you do, um, yeah. Certainly, I do. Yeah. Um, so you, you've been married um, twice. Married twice. Um, so the second one was um, to um, a, a girl in her early twenties when you were uh, when I was uh, forty. 40s, so there's right. pretty decent age gap. That was fun, but um, yeah, it sort of didn't didn't last the distance, although Miller and I were together probably five years. Mm. Um, you guys, have, you guys have kids together? No. 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 Um, what, ha- what happened there? Was it just the age in the end? Oh, sh- yeah, just the age, I think. Yeah. And um, Miller had a fair bit of living to do and she needed to get on and do it, um, mm. which was probably quite obvious, I think. But, um, I mean, we had a lot of fun together. It was, mm. And we're still friends to this day, so yeah. that's nice. Um, well, that must uh, the fact that you're still you still remain friends with these people, even going back as uh, to the the partner Kate that we referenced at the very beginning of the podcast. I, I mean, you need to take some of the credit, I think, for those relationships. Yeah, I think there's always that period afterwards where there's sort of not a lot of communication. But I think, you know, if you, these mm. relationships that are meaningful, um, it seems a bit of a waste just to let them go, right? Yeah. Because you know you have you have some great times, obviously. You, you have some tough stuff as well, but. Mm. Um, I think as the passage of time sort of uh, is pretty good for that sort of stuff, has been yeah. my experience. Um, Save what you can from the fire, I guess. Yeah, and I think also, certainly in my case, when things get difficult for me, um, you know, those people are very supportive. Mm. And I think that, well, hopefully that means that at some stage along the line you've done done some good stuff. Yeah. Oh, how cool. Yeah, so the, the age difference with you and your second wife, Miller, that's... Um, almost identical to the age gap that I have at the moment with um, with my partner, Ash. We've been seeing each other for a year. And it, it doesn't seem doesn't seem that noticeable. And, uh, you know, it, it's hard. How much was age involved with your I, with your split, ultimately, do you think? I, I don't think it was necessarily the, the age. I always sort of said to Miller that so long as one of us is acting your age, we're probably all right. <laughs> I feel like that was probably mostly you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like me in my situation with my partner Ash. I feel like um, she's the nana in the relationship. Yeah, um, but I think it was just. I, I think the age gap became a little bit more obvious, and not so much in the, in the fact that it was a mismatch, but more in the fact that Miller had a whole pile of stuff she needed to do that mm. I'd already done. Um, you know, and so she needed to go on and do that. And it was as simple as that. Yeah, that must be. Weird. Which was a bit heartbreaking, but you know, mm. it, is, it wasn't with hindsight, not unexpected. Yeah. And she's good now. She's seeing someone else. She's or? great. She lives in Brisbane. I think she's lived in Brisbane for five years. Yeah, she's in a relationship with um, pretty good guy. She's happy. 
Yeah, um, oh, that's cool. And your, your current partner, who I can't thank enough because she ended up teeing up this interview, otherwise this never would have happened. Um, how long have you guys been seeing each other? About a year, just under a year. Yeah. Yep. Um, and that was uh, that was pretty unexpected. I'd sort of kind of given it away, to be honest. Um, I was looking at options in terms of living overseas, um, uh, sort of got to 50 and sort of thought, we've well, sort of done this. There's a big wide world out there. I might as well go get in it. And as always, Don, when you're sort of at least looking for something, it, it happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, So that was a very pleasant surprise, and we've had a great year together. Mm. Um, are, you, are, you, are you one of these people that, um, do you get quite lonely on your own, or are you okay on your own? No, I like being on my own. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I sort of thought that that was going to be it for me, to be honest. I, I look at these things sort of quite logically, and I sort of went, well, I've, you know, I've had, you know, three sort of pretty great love affairs. That sounds like a lot. Um, oh, over the course of a life, it isn't really, is it? <laughs> there might be another one out there for me, yeah. but, you know, if, As it, if, you the, if that's the end of it, I've had a red hot go, right? Yeah. <laughs> you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't rule out marriage again? <laughs> oh, no, definitely not. No. I, mean, I love being married. Um, yeah. Uh, despite the fact that to date I haven't proved to be very good at it, I still enjoy it. Um, I don't know. So how long are they like? So eight years with Sally, how long uh, with Miller? Five years with, five years right. with Miller. Yeah. Um, it's hard, isn't it? Because you get you get married and it's um, you know, till death do us part and yeah, forever and ever. And so anything less than that feels like a fail. But I, I don't know. I think um, if you can if you can give it a red hot crack and end up like with salvaging something from the relationship at the end of it, I feel yeah. like that's a success in some ways. Yeah, I think so. And then what, there's one more in there that you've missed, which is which is Danny, who um, I'm separated from now, a couple of years ago. Oh, uh, a third. You've, well, no, Sally, right. and, Sally and I weren't married. Oh, okay, right. So Miller and Danny. Right. Who's, where did Danny fit into the picture? So Danny and I uh, dated way back right. uh, early on and then didn't see each other for 18 years. We right. often had our own lives and then sort of um, reconnected after I got back from K2 in 2017. Right. Married for a few years um, and then separated. Um, and so we've been separated almost two years now, I think. Um, well, that's a shame. Because after that sort of gap and then reconnecting, you must feel like you're, you're sort of... Sp- star-crossed lovers or soulmates or something like that that's meant to be together, right? Yeah, well, that was the thinking. But I think um, with hindsight, you know, the passage of time is not always kind to these things. And, you know, we had, by that stage, there were multiple kids involved and, you know, it was complicated. Mm. Um, uh, I think I think it was more complicated and more difficult than either of us thought because, obviously, you know, we had known each other for a long time. Um, we dated for five years, I think, the first time. Mm. Um but it was literally a different time and a different... It was just the two of us, so everything's kind of quite easy. Mm. Right? Um, we didn't have any real-life pressures. Um, we didn't live together. We just yeah. dated. Um, we travelled a lot, um, and we were young. Um, and that was quite easy. And I think, you know, fast forward 18 years, suddenly, you know, danny has got three kids to another marriage, young kids. Um, all of a sudden, you've got a whole pile of complications yeah. and compromises, and it was just... it was. I it's think, too hard. you know, we both tried as hard as we could and mm. gave it our best shot, but it was just, you know, difficult. Yeah. Um, and I think also, you know, that that's life. Mm. Um, it is. It is. It's part of the, the rich right. tapestry of it. Shit, you've been through some stuff, haven't you? How's, yeah. your, how's your mental health been over the years through all this stuff? Yeah. I, uh, you, pretty, you, pretty you, good. You but seem like quite a resilient dude, eh? Yeah, I'm pretty resilient, but also um, I go away and do the hard yards, you know, so... In uh, terms of working on yourself? Yeah. 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 Um, I try not to run away from the way that I'm feeling. You know, I try and sit th- sit with it as much as I can, which mm. feels like shit, mate. You know, you know, you come out of these relationships, um, and it takes you six to twelve months to get yourself back together again. When I separated from Miller, I literally couldn't breathe for twelve months. Um, I would, How do you mean? What do you mean? I had terrible anxiety. Right. Um, uh, and like I'd literally wake up in the morning gasping for breath. Um, and uh, and with Dani, when we separated, I had, yeah, terrible, I get terrible anxiety, um, which is where the exercise comes from, because, mm. uh, you know, there's times where I actually can't sit, I actually have to go train, yeah. um, otherwise I just can't, physically can't handle it, um, can't, yeah. uh, wow. and I, I think that's, if you'd said to me when I was 25 years of age, one day you'll get anxiety, I would have gone, fuck off, that'll never happen to me, mm. um, but it has. Um, and I, I, you know, over the years I'm, I'm learning to manage it, but, mm. um, you know, I think at times, I think all of our mental health is not quite what it could be. Yeah. Um, and I'm no different, mate. Um, and unfortunately that's just part of growing up, right? Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, and then the, the, the older you get, you realise no one's no one's immune to it. No. And I, actually, I think when you get older, you sort of accumulate more emotional scar tissue. It's like getting dirty gym gear and putting it in a bag and chucking it under, under the car boot or whatever. It's not going to clean itself. Eventually, no. you're going to have to Well, you've got to deal it. with it, right? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, like even now, I get triggered. Mm. Things happen that trigger me. Right? And um, when I was younger, I didn't, I didn't, had no experiences, so I was pretty bulletproof, you know? Mm. Just kind of managed to shrug my shoulders and roll through everything. Um, but as life goes on and you have some, some experiences that are not so positive, um, you start to accumulate a bit of baggage, right? mm. and I think it's important to deal with it. Do you, do you think part of that for you comes from like the, the, the public flogging that you've had over the years? Uh, not so much lately no. because I've been sort of pretty insulated from that for yeah. sort of 10 or 15 years. Yeah, you have. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I've got a very tight group of friends, so I'm not exposed to it too much. Mm. I'm not in the media. Um, uh, and on the odd occasion that I am, it's never a great experience. Um, so I sort of try to minimise that as much as I can. Mm. Um, so I don't feel that much anymore. Um, it's more just around dealing with my own personal issues. Yeah. Um, around, you know. You know, just relationships, pr- yeah, pr- uh, predominantly. So, what, so you, you exercise a lot. You're like you're in like, uh, physically, you're in incredible shape. You're looking amazing. Um, Thanks, so, Don. so, so uh, <laughs> not not hitting on I you do, by the I way. I do do the work. <laughs> yeah. So, so you do that. Um, you, you're in therapy. Uh, you got any other tricks or, or tips that you do? You do cold showers or saunas or uh, journaling or anything? Uh, no, I do write a bit of a journal um, on occasions when I feel like it. That sort of comes and goes. Yeah. Um, uh, but typically I try to live pretty well, you know, mm-hmm. um, and that's, I eat well, obviously, exercise is important for me in terms of my own mental health, um, and I socialise, I spend a lot of time with friends and family, I enjoy that, I try not to drink too much, so mm-hmm. that's always a bit of a, something I'm conscious of, because um, I don't <laughs> think that's great for your mental health. No, um, you definitely notice it, don't you? As well, it's a de- it is a depressant. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so I try to I, I keep my eye on mm-hmm. that, um, but also I like to socialise. You know, and, and in New Zealand, you go out and you have a few beers or you, or you have some wine. Um, mm. So I think being able to balance that's been really important. And I think that's probably a key word for me, Dom, is balance, trying yeah. to find that balance. Um, when I was younger, I was sort of, you know, all or nothing. And I think um, over the years, I've learned to moderate that. And I think clo- I'm closer. You know, I'm 52. Mm. I'm still not the finished article. I've got a bit of work to do, but I'm... Certainly, I think closer than I've been before. Mm. Um, yeah, are you, are you happy now? Like when you look in the mirror as a fifty-two-year-old man, you're happy with yep. who you see looking back at you. Yep. Yeah, yeah, no, I am. I think, um, particularly the last twelve months, probably been as happy as I've ever been in my life. Mm. Um, and I've had times where I've looked in the mirror and I really didn't like the guy who was looking back at me. Um, and I can remember a couple of occasions where I've sort of looked at him and gone, "Who the fuck are you? And what have you done with my mate?" Um, mm. And that's been a bit of a wake-up call. Um, but I think being able to you know, being able to sort of turn that intuition on yourself and, and critically examine yourself and be honest with yourself is important, mm. really important, particularly if you want to get better. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I say to my kids, listen, I am a long way from perfect, but I do try. You know, I get up every day and I try to be better, and I think that counts for a lot. Yeah, absolutely, it does. Oh, I reckon you're a good dad and a good person. Still learning about the, yeah. the dad bit. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone, hey, anyone that ever sits back and goes, yep, I've cracked it, yeah, is no, full no. of shit. Because they keep changing, right? <laughs> They're tricky. Um. That's it. We, we all do, though. And I, th- I think that's the exciting thing. I, I saw a, a, Matthew McConaughey made a speech. It was like for the uh, Oscars or something like that. And he was asked who his superhero is. And he said, his super, he was asked when he was 25. And he said, my superhero is me in 10 years. I saw time. that speech. Yeah. And then at 35, he was asked the same thing. And yeah. I think that's a good way of looking at it. It's uh, a great way of looking at it. Visit yourself in ten years, and isn't it exciting to think? Yeah, at fifty-two, you, you still realise you're a work in progress, and you're still getting better. Oh, absolutely. Um, mm. And I think um, the benefit of age is you just, you know, you, you do if you're paying attention, you, you do pick up a few tips along the way. Yeah, life does or should get easier. It doesn't get it doesn't get easy, but it should get easier. <laughs> um, and I think you know, trying not to make the same mistake too many times is, is a bit helpful as well. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Well, that's a good takeaway. Well, and you're, you're, you're a lot, you must be a lot kinder now to others and yourself than what you were in your 20s. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I talk to people. You mm. know? Um, and I'm a, I was very self-conscious in my uh, 20s particularly, and I'm very much less so now. Um, I think I maintained a sense of humour right the way through. Um, I 
definitely don't take myself too seriously anymore, and I used to take myself very seriously. Mm. Uh, and I don't really do that much now. Mm. Um, and that's been a bit of a relief, to be honest. Um, yeah, yeah, life's definitely got easier. I think playing professional sport is a really difficult thing to do as a young person mm. um, in many, many ways. And I don't think it's very under, very well understood. Mm. Um, but it's a big task, and you've got a lot of respect for young people who take that on and succeed. It's, mm. it's not easy to do. Yeah. Hey, well, look, I, I can't thank you enough. As I said before, you you don't you are notoriously private these days. You don't do a lot of these stuff, and I feel like you've been um, really unguarded today. And uh, even like in the last ten or fifteen minutes, shown some real vulnerability. And I don't know if that's easy for you to do, or it's getting easier. Yeah. Um, and actually, that word it's interesting the vulnerability word because that comes up a lot with me. Mm. Um, uh, I never heard that word in my 20s and 30s. Like, nobody was talking about it, right? Mm. And I think society's changed. Like, the word never got said. Like, it just never got said. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. Because no, we're, like, yeah, we're swimming in the same sort of waters at that age. Yeah. And it's like any, you'd never show any sort of weakness because it could no, be wep- no. weaponized against you. Yeah, that was the last thing you did. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, whereas I think society's changed now. And I think, you know, particularly as men and young men, being vulnerable is seen rightly as as a symbol of strength not mm. not weakness um and when i was in my early 20s vulnerability was weakness um and i think you know our culture around that stuff has changed for the better and I'm, you know aston's 19 and he's he's sort of starting to learn about some of this stuff now and i just it's a much it's a much more constructive environment for mm. young people these days i think which is nice to be a part yeah, of Yeah, absolutely when was the last time you cried you cry much <laughs> regularly do you um, yep. <laughs> how good uh, you love it it's good. I don't know it's if I love it <laughs> but it's a regular <laughs> um, yeah yeah oh, a week ago probably right yep. can you remember what it was about or you don't want to say if you don't want to say that's alright uh, yeah no I can remember what it's about it was, it was um, you know I was just having a bit of a moment remembering one of my friends yeah, yeah. Oh, and it, that's normally Particularly when I think back on memories and people that have been close to me, often you know that I am quite emotional mm. um, and very soft underneath, mm. um, which has taken me a few years to sort of start to understand. But um, that, that's who I am, right? Yeah, I oh, mean, I'm, I'm much the same. There was, there was probably a period where I went for like 15 years without crying at all. Really? <laughs> yeah, and um, now, uh, yeah, I've got, uh, yeah, I, I, I love it. I love having. I think it's cry. quite healthy. Yeah, um, it is. It is. I, I, I can cry just th- like dwelling and thinking about happy stuff for more than a moment. Yeah, yeah, and I find it quite easy. And, it, and as I said, it's a regular for me. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I def- and, and I sort of, I used to try and push it away, but. Not so much anymore. Yeah. Oh, good for you. Oh, you're a, you're a kind man. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I, man, I was probably much the same with, with as you with my radio career. Like during my twenties, all I wanted to be was a fucking savage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now, if if some if someone says to me, "Oh, you you're a kind person," I I take that as the ultimate compliment. I think. Yeah, that's, that's a very good. nice compliment. I mean, I certainly I had my walls up. You know, that was that was a thing. Mm. And learning how to sort of drop those down and keep them down has been good for me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, life's hard for everyone. If we can all do our bit to make it a bit easier for someone else, I think that's a good thing. Absolutely. Anyway, an hour and a half of your time after you promised me an hour. Um, thank you so much. I hope you don't regret um, opening up for the first time in 10 years. Enjoyed it, Don. It's been such a pleasure. Thanks for having yeah. me. Yeah, thanks so much, Adam. You're a great New Zealander. Thanks, mate. I appreciate it.